Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. He's dead, isn't he? You know exactly who I'm talking about. He's dead. I know it, you know it. There is no way that Dandelion is not dead. He's gone to the castle where he's banged someone he shouldn't have. He went there alone without any of the other group with some random knights. And now Geralt's gonna go back to that castle and find him hanging from the gate or beaten and he's going to watch Dandelion be hung from the gallows. And then Geralt steals back Dandelion's manuscript for half a century of poetry and Geralt, honoring his friend, publishes it after Dandelion's death. That's what happened, isn't it? And that's why we see snippets of half a century of poetry in the earlier books and in this book. It's to throw us off the scent that Dandelion's dead. Obviously, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my theory and I cannot wait to get into the next book and find out if Dandelion's dead or not. But my money is that he is dead. He banged the wrong person, the Count or the Duke or whoever he was. He isn't actually dead. He just told his knights to say that so they could get Dandelion back to the village or the castle or whatever. And then he's going to get his revenge on him. That's my theory. I don't know if it's true or not, but I really just had to start this video off. I had to get that out of my head because if you watch no more of this video, I just want you to know my theory around Dandelion. And I'll quote the exact moment in the book where I think Dandelion died but I'll do that a little later when I'm talking about characters. So as you've probably guessed by now, this is a book review of The Tower of the Swallow. In my last review, I said that a lot of people say that Baptism of Fire is their favorite book in the Witcher series, but honestly, this is my favorite book in the Witcher series. I even prefer it over the short stories, and I really enjoyed the short stories. This book was action-packed and fast-paced, and most importantly to me, the author didn't include a lot of those long, drawn-out council war meetings that usually bring the pacing of these books to an absolute standstill. There was only maybe one, and that only lasted for about 20 pages or so. So by far, this has been my absolute favorite book in the series. We got to see a lot more of Ciri being a badass. There was a lot of character growth, a lot of character development, a lot of interesting stuff happened. So by far, my favorite book so far. Also, make sure you comment below all of your Witcher thoughts, theories, any conversations about the Witcher that you want to have, because by the time I upload this video, I would have already read the last book in the series. And that's not a coincidence, because I'm not uploading this video until I've read the last book, because I've managed to avoid spoilers all the way up to book number six or seven, and I want to make sure that I get no spoilers for the last book. So by the time you see this video, I would have finished the Witcher series. So post all of your spoiler comments. Let's get a conversation going. If there's anything you want to talk about, let's talk about it. Comment if you knew Dandelion was dead or not, or if he's still alive, did you think he was dead? But yeah, if everything goes to plan, this video will go up on Tuesday and my book review for The Lady of the Lake should go up on Thursday. And then I should have a review for Seasons of Storm up the next Tuesday. And then maybe I'll do some more Witcher content after that. One of the interesting things about this story was how the story was presented. It went from a regular third person narrative to many people telling the same story in different places at different times. And this is a very risky move for authors to do because if you do this kind of storytelling incorrectly, then it can become very disorientating for the reader and it can make it very hard to pick up on those subtle bits of foreshadowing that you want to put into your story because your reader is too busy trying to figure out who's telling this story, why they're telling their story and what association they have to the story that they can't really focus on those minor details. I believe personally that this author did a fantastic job of this split perspective and kind of flashback storytelling. I was able to follow the whole time and uh, I haven't read a lot of stories that have this sort of storytelling so it's not like I'm well versed in this form of storytelling but I managed to follow it the whole time. I didn't feel disorientated at all. I understood why each character was telling the story and I understood why each character was in the position they were in to be telling the story and what association they had. And also I really enjoyed all the little snippets that you got to see from Dandelion's half a century of poetry, even though I'm pretty sure he's dead. I did really enjoy the bits where you got to see him writing about his current adventures as they were happening. So anyway, let's get into this review with a brief recap of everything that happened in this book. I'm gonna make this incredibly brief because I got a lot of other stuff that I wanna say and I don't want this video to be too long. So if I miss out any key points, please forgive me. 
The book starts off with a hermit discovering Ciri in a swamp and she is badly injured. The hermit takes her in and heals her back to full health. And in return, Ciri helps him around his house. She ends up telling him the story about how she got into a fight, how she was a part of the rats, everything that happened with Bonhart, and how she ended up in the swamp. She leaves the rats to go and claim her life as a princess. She tells Missile that she loves her, and the rats find out that someone is trying to hunt them down and kill them. There's a bounty hunter on their trail. And they decide that the best course of action is for them to go confront the bounty hunter, who's famous, and then kill him in battle, so that way they can have the glory attached to their name. The bounty hunter is a absolute weapon and kills them all in a duel. Siri comes riding in just too late, sees them all dead, and then Bonhart fights her and realizes that she is special. There's something about this girl. She's the one that he was sent there specifically to kill, but he realizes that there's something special about her and he could probably make more money off of her. So he beats the crap out of her, puts a collar on her neck and takes her to a arena to see if she can fight or not. Siri kills a bunch of people in the arena. Bonhart realizes she's worth more money. So he goes and he ties her to a post while he negotiates with the person that originally did his contract to try and get more money out of him. While all that's happening, a cytonic or a psychic person, brain magic, I can't really remember what the term is, I just read Skyward, so I'm just going to call him a cytonic, tries to read Ciri's mind, but Ciri's mind, being such a magical beast, reactivates her magic powers or something, and blows the other girl's mind away. Ciri then escapes, where she ends up finding the hermit, the hermit brings her back to health, and then she goes to the Tower of the Swallow. While she's on her way there, she ends up on the ice, and gets into a fight with all these people, kills a bunch of them, spares the bounty hunter, and then she escapes through the tower. Yennefer is still being pursued. She ends up going to a special island to talk to some priestesses so she can get a big diamond so she can talk to some other wizards. She ends up being captured by Volfigetz or whatever his name is. Let's just call him V. I'm just going to call him V because I don't know how to say his name. She ends up being captured by him and then he starts to torture her because he needs her information to find out where Ciri is. Although you didn't really get to follow a lot of uh, Yennefer in this story, I thought that her story was very interesting. And I felt uh, closer to Yennefer after reading this. Because to me, Yennefer was always like, I wasn't really sure how I felt about her, because you only really saw her through Geralt's perspective or through Ciri's perspective as they're interacting with them. It was really nice to just have Yennefer on her own doing whatever it is that she wanted to do. And during Yennefer's story, there's also the foreshadowing of Ciri being a really good skater. I thought that was a really clever piece of foreshadowing by the author. Geralt became a knight at the end of the last book. So in this book, he was just living his best knight life, traveling around with the Rivian army. He was eating good food and he was sleeping in good beds. But everything became an issue when the Rivian army decided to turn away from where Geralt needed to go, which was to go and talk to the druids. Geralt and his friends uh, deserted the Rivian army, and while walking through the forest, they came across some beekeepers. The beekeepers tell Geralt that the druids have left the specific forest and have moved over to some mountainside instead. And they also ask Geralt to escort them all to the mountainside because that's where they go during winter and the road is dangerous. Geralt ends up in a mine with a couple of his friends and they find the half-elf that is trying to kill them. A big battle breaks out, the half-elf escapes, Geralt and his friends chase them down, but before they can get information from them, the druids are burning these people alive in fires. All right, that was my very brief, hopefully, recap of this book. And now that that's all out of the way, I want to get onto my dandelion theory. Firstly, I want to address the fact that in the last book and throughout most of this book, Dandelion was no longer acting like what in Australia we would call a sex pest. Or I believe other people will call it a fuckboy. Because in the last two books, it seems that he's grown a lot and he's moved out of that womanizing kind of mind frame. So when he wrote this in his diary, I actually noted it down. Because it was so out of place that all of a sudden he'd started womanizing again. So this is from one of the snippets of half a century of poetry after they decided to travel with the beekeepers. And I quote, We set off northwards towards the slopes, a land lying at the foot of the Amel Mountains. We set off in a great procession which contained everything, young women, forest beekeepers, fur trappers, women, children, young women, domestic livestock, household paraphernalia, and young women, and a hell of a lot of honey, 
everything was sticky from the honey even the girls so you can see the point i'm trying to make here there was such a disconnect from dandelion's womanizing ways in the past two books like he didn't even womanize with milva so it was really interesting to me that he started writing that again and it was so interesting that i actually noted it down and a little later on in the book uh they are talking about going to this certain castle and Dandelion says, I would rather die than go to that place. And he doesn't really explain in that moment why he doesn't really want to go there. But Geralt presumes that he banged someone's wife and now that that man wants revenge. Which is exactly what happened. It was exactly why Dandelion was trying to avoid that place. So I'm going to read you the exact moment where Dandelion splits off from the group and I'm pretty sure that he's died. So basically a knight has come across Geralt and his friends after a battle. And Geralt desperately wants to chase the half-elf into the forest. But this knight is stopping them. Because he wants to talk to him first. Because he recognized Dandelion. And for some reason they call Dandelion Viscount Julian. So the knight says, Viscount Julian will ride with us to Beauclair Castle. The Duchess wouldn't forgive us if after meeting you, we didn't bring you to her. I shan't stop the rest of you. You are free in your plans and ideas. As the companions of Viscount Julian, Her Grace Lady Henrietta would gladly receive you all with due respect and invited you to stay at the castle. Upon my word, the Baron suddenly laughed. No disgrace nor dishonor will fall, Viscount Julian. I'm prepared to give my word on it. For I omitted to tell you, Viscount, that Duke Raymond died of a poxley two years past. Ha ha, Dandelion shouted, beaming all over. The Duke kicked the bucket. These truly are marvelous and joyous tidings. I mean, I meant to say sorry and grief, a great loss. May the earth lie lightly on him. If that is the case, let's ride with all haste to Beauclair, noble knights. Geralt and Milva, I'll see you in the castle. That is the point where I think Dandelion has died. I believe that the Duke has heard about Geralt and Dandelion in the area, because earlier in the book they did have to talk to some officials of the area. The Duke said, bring Dandelion back, tell him I have died, he will come running back to bang my wife, which is exactly what dandelion's done and it's also incredibly suspicious that we did not hear from dandelion for the rest of the book that happened on page 259 and there are 436 pages in this book so that's almost 200 pages through this book where dandelion disappeared from the group to go and bang someone else's wife and then we didn't hear back from him that is hella suspicious to me and it really puts me in mind to the old saying that if a man lives by the sword, it's only fitting that he die by the sword. It's just in Dandelion's case, it's his meat sword. All right, enough about Dandelion, because for all I know, I could actually be very wrong. So let's get into Siri. Holy crap. What a great, intense story involving Siri. Her growth as a character, her being able to show off her cool ninja moves, her descent into being what would be considered a bad person. It was all fantastic. In my last Witcher review, I said that I was hoping there'd be a lot more Siri in this book. And I said I was hoping that there would be some really cool, solid, badass reason why Siri had to leave the rats. And I honestly could not have predicted the way that it went. And I'm so glad it went the way that it went because it was intense and spectacular. I loved seeing how Ciri uh, really was shown to descent into the chaos. She was shown doing drugs, she got a tattoo on her naughty bits, and she was bisexual. Which, in the days that this book was written, I'm sure those three things would have been a lot more seen as descending into chaos. Not so much these days, but these books were written in a different time. But more than that, she started to really enjoy and revel in the brutality of death. And the best way that I can really explain this is when you read the descriptions of Ciri's fight scenes and you compare it to the descriptions of Geralt's fight scenes, not only in this book, but across the whole series, when Ciri is killing people, it's brutal and guttural and vicious. She slices people up to the point where she knows that they won't live, but lets them drown in their own blood or leaves them brutally disfigured or leaves them screaming to slowly die. Compare that to Geralt's fight scenes 
And it almost seems as if the author is describing a ballerina. It's, it's almost as if to the author, Geralt's fight scenes are more like a dance. He spins and pirouettes and he does a half turn and lightly deflects a blow. And when he kills, his sword skillfully nicks an artery and his enemy dies very quickly. There is no emotion to it. There is no anger, there's no violence, there's no hatred. It's just a dance. Like I already said, this is definitely my favorite Witcher book in the series, and it's all about Ciri's descent. How she went from on top of the world, a feared but also beloved bandit that would parade and peacock herself around with fine jewelry and fine clothes, but not only in that artificial sense, she was also the best swordsman around. She'd killed plenty of people. She would fight anyone that stood against him and she was cocky because of it, because she was the best. And then from that highest of high, she had all of her friends killed. She was stripped naked, lost all of her fancy clothes and a collar was put on her neck. So she went from being free to literally being caged. She lost everything that elevated her. But not only that, I feel as if the psychological effect of also losing the fight, knowing that she was no longer the most badass person, this guy had the opportunity to kill her, but instead just slapped her, was a very big disrespectful moment to her because she was a warrior. But in that moment, he took that away from her. She went from on top of the world to gimp girl. But I also really liked all of Ciri's interactions with the hermit that saved her life. I liked that they got along, I liked that they argued and fought with each other. But there was one particular thing that the hermit said that I really, really enjoyed. And I thought that this particular scene was so great because there is so much plotting and scheming about Ciri and how she's this big, bad, legendary child that her blood is going to end the world. And even when you are following Ciri, it's so easy for the reader to get caught up in the fact that she's a badass that was trained to be a witcher girl. It can be so easy to forget that at the end of the day, she still is just a girl. She's not even 16 yet. She really is just a young girl that's been through a lot of mental and physical trauma. And I really liked the fact that the old hermit was removed enough from the situation to see her as just a young girl and just care for her as if a father to his daughter. And the scene I'm talking about specifically happens on page 364. Siri and the old hermit are arguing because Siri wants to run off and go out into the wilderness and live her best hero life. And the old hermit is mad. And he says, you're an unstable young person. You're a child who's been through traumatic experiences, a damaged child on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And more than that, you're sick with a craving for revenge, blinded by a lust for retribution. Don't you understand that? And I think that's such a great scene when the hermit is just like, you might be this like great legendary human that's gonna do all these things. But the fact is right now, you're just a damaged child. You need to fix yourself. I really, really liked that part. In summary, I really liked all of Ciri's transformations in this book. I liked all of her wins. I liked all of her losses. This is exactly what I wanted from this book. More Ciri and I wanted it to be super meaningful. It was dark, it was dirty, it was emotional, and I'm glad I was there for it. And talking about being there for people, if you're new to my channel, I'm all about books, whether it be reading them, writing them, or reviewing them. So if you like books, please subscribe to the channel. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers and I would really appreciate your subscription. Also, please like this video and comment down below anything you want. Don't be afraid of spoilers because by the time you see this video, I will have read the entire series. So thank you very much for watching and thank you for supporting my channel. Now, I wanna to touch on Regis for a second. The more Regis is in this book, the more I enjoy it. Not specifically because of his character, although I do like his character, but the more interaction Geralt and Regis has, the more that I enjoy the fact that it really shows Geralt as just a gray character and it really shows how much all he wants in the world is to get Ciri back, that he's working with this vampire that on any other day he'd be paid to kill. But more than that, I like how Regis handles Geralt's temper and he does it so calmly because he's immortal. 
And I really, really like this interaction because the only other person that you really get to see this interaction from is Geralt and Dandelion. But whenever Geralt gets angry or cold or bitter, Dandelion tends to shy away. And I want to give you a really good example of what I'm talking about. Page 106, in case you want to see it yourself. They're with the beekeepers and they're discussing whether or not they should travel with the beekeepers or not. Let me start by saying, he said, that the forest beekeeper is right, Geralt. It is quite probable that the druids have gone to the slopes. It is perfectly fitting terrain for them. Is that probability, the witch's gaze was very, very cold, sufficiently great in your view to prompt us to abruptly change our course and head off blindly with these folk here? Regis shrugged again. What difference does it make? Think it over. The druids are not in the forest, so we ought to eliminate that direction of travel. Neither can a return to the river. I venture be an option. And so all remaining directions are equally good. Really, the temperature of the witch's voice now equaled his gaze. And which of those that remain in your view would be most advisable? The one with the forest beekeepers or a quite different one? Will you, in your infinite wisdom, undertake to stipulate that? And I really, I really like that because the fact is Geralt started by giving Regis an icy, icy look. And Regis was just like, yeah, whatever. These are the facts. Now, the reason I specifically wanted to point out that was because if this interaction happened with Dandelion, at the first sight of Geralt giving Dandelion the icy, icy look, he would have slinked away. But Regis didn't care. Regis was just like, you can give me icy looks and give me that tone all you want, Mr. Sassy Geralt, but facts don't care about your feelings. And being mad doesn't change the facts. So I did really enjoy that interaction between Regis and Geralt, and it happened a lot because Geralt really hates the fact that Regis is a know-it-all. But I think it's got more to do with the fact that Regis is immortal, and Geralt doesn't like the fact that he doesn't know that he could beat him in a fight. That's just my opinion. I think Geralt might be a little bit controlling, and he likes to know that if any of his companions turned on him, he would be able to beat them in a fight. But he can't with Regis. And I think that's why he's really mad at him, or why he's got such a short temper with him because Regis don't care. And honestly, I really enjoy that interaction. I do have some serious questions that I want answered in the next book. And these questions, if they've already explained it in the book and I just haven't caught on because I'm dumb, please put them down in the comments below. But these are some questions that I've had or that I expect to be answered in the last book. Firstly, the last wish, right? The, what is it, I, uh, the original short story of The Witcher, The Last Wish, right? If you've read them, then you would know that Geralt's last wish, when Yennefer is fighting the genie, and Geralt's there with Yennefer and the genie's about to kill them, or the genie's about to kill Yennefer, Geralt's last wish is that he dies when Yennefer dies or like their lifelines are connected, or there's some kind of like thing where if Yennefer dies, Geralt dies. Now, the thing is, this hasn't been addressed in any of the books after The Last Wish. Like we know that Geralt and Yennefer, there's like very mildly indications that they're like tied together, but that could also be interpreted as they're tied together because they're romantically linked or because they're tied together because of Siri. And I could just be reading into it because I've been distinctly looking for any sign of the last wish coming up in these stories. So was that just some random throwaway thing? Does that come up at all? Because that seems like a really weird thing to just never come up again in like seven other books. The fact that Geralt and Yennefer are tied together by their lives. Next is, what is the deal with uh, the Nilfgaardian that's traveling with Geralt? Is his name Cahir or Sahir or Cahir? I don't know, but that's not the question. The question is, why does he keep saying he's not a Nilfgaardian? Is it because he was banished from there? because I'm pretty sure he wasn't banished. I'm pretty sure he's still technically on his mission. Also, when he fought the Nilfgaardian army on that bridge, he said that they were his kinfolk or they were his countrymen or whatever. So he said in that moment that he's, he's Nilfgaardian. So I'm wondering, what is the deal with that? Does that get explained or has it already been explained? Was it explained when Cahir and Geralt got into a fight over the fire? I don't know. And I'm hoping that I'll find out in this next book. Um, obviously, is Dandelion dead? That would be fantastic to find out. Um, what is the go with Ciri existing outside of time and space? 
Is this some kind of Rick and Morty thing? But one of the biggest questions I've got is what is the go with Triss and Sodden Hill? Because as far as I'm aware, Triss died on Sodden Hill with a whole bunch of other sorcerers and that all happened before this big war took off. Is Triss a ghost? Is she a zombie? Was her name mistakenly put on that memorial? Did she fight but not die? And sometimes the battle is talked about as if it's in the future, but it's already happened and Triss has already died. Or it's coming up in the future and Triss will die there. Maybe there'll be another battle there and Triss will die there. I don't know. I really hope that gets explained to me. If that's already been explained and I just wasn't smart enough to get it, please tell me in the comments below. Anyways, guys, that's all I got for you today. Like I said, please like this video, subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate the subscription and comment down below all of your Witcher comments. Don't worry about spoilers. I'm ready for this big Witcher conversation. And as always, thank you very much.